Well, hey, my name is Samer. Good morning, good afternoon, whenever you are seeing this. My name is Samer Massad, and I am the lead pastor at Woodstock City Church over the United States uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, just north of Atlanta, Georgia. And I wanna say a quick hello to Grace Family Church, South Point Church, Waypoint Church, and Compass Church. I hope I got that pronunciation right. I worked really hard on it. It is such a privilege to be with you guys uh, today. And I know I'm a new face, a new voice. So just a little about me. I got a picture of my family because when I show cute kids, it makes everybody like me. Okay, this is my wife, Julie. We've been married for almost 10 years. And these are our four girls. We've got Harper, Samantha, Zara, and Layla, the freshest one of the bunch. And so, yeah, I'm a girl dad to the max. We are not having any more kids. If you're wondering, we are very satisfied with four. But like I said, uh, such an honor to be speaking to you today. And what a privilege it is. I'm gonna be down in South Africa for a week with a lot of your staff and pastors talking about church and specifically how to rethink church so that we can be further aligned with the very heart of God in the mission of Jesus. And that's what I wanna talk about for a few minutes today, the very heart of God and the mission of Jesus, because you, you are a part of it and I am a part of it. When you open up the pages of the gospels, one of the most interesting things and one of the most fascinating things that you'll, you'll notice is that those, those that were nothing like Jesus liked Jesus and Jesus liked them back. It's amazing. I mean, Jesus was a rabbi. He was a religious person. And the people that you think he would get along with, he didn't get along with. The people that did all the stuff in the temple and gave the sacrifices and knew the law, the Pharisees, that's who you think he would roll with. But it's not. It's in fact who he clashed with. It's the complete opposite in the gospels. In fact, those on the outside of faith and those on the outside of religion and the marginalized, those that the religious leaders looked down upon were the ones that found Jesus so compelling Those on the outside of faith, they were the ones that wanted to hear Jesus. They were the ones whose curiosity was piqued by Jesus. They were the ones that were drawn to his kindness and they were the ones that believed that the heart of Jesus was actually for them. And Jesus, he made it such a habit to give relational access to those that were outside of the faith, those that were, um, that were looked down upon by the religious leaders. It was such a habit of his that he developed quite the reputation. In fact, in Luke chapter seven, Jesus here, he is quoting what the Pharisees say about him. And so Jesus quoting the Pharisees says, the son of man came eating and drinking. And you say, here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. A friend of tax collectors and sinners was so bad in the eyes of the Pharisees and the religious leaders that it was on par with being a drunkard and a glutton. And this indictment was meant to be derogatory towards Jesus, but ironically, it was actually explanatory of what he came to do in the heart that he came to reflect. And as the body of Christ, here's the tension for us today. As the body of Christ, the church, if you are a follower of Jesus, what was true of Jesus personally should also be true of us collectively. What was true of him personally, how he carried himself in the heart that he had should also be true of us. And part of the problem today, and come on, you, you felt this, The church, the church has a reputation problem in the eyes of so many that are disconnected from God. The church has a reputation problem with those on the outside of faith. In fact, some of you watching, if you're being honest, that might be your story, that it's a miracle you are in church today because of your bad church experience, specifically connected to the way that you were treated by a Christian, right? I mean, come on, and I'm the first offender. We're often known as judgmental, harsh, mean and even legalistic. And that should break our hearts because it is not the heart of God and it is not God's disposition towards those relationally disconnected from him. Regardless of what they believe, regardless of whether they, 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 they believe the same things we do, live the way that they think we should live, God's heart breaks when people are relationally disconnected from him. And it's the very reason why Jesus came. And there's a beautiful picture for us of this in Luke chapter 15. I wanna look at these these sequence of parables that Jesus tells. They're maybe the most famous parables in all of the New Testament. They happen back to back to back. And they communicate to us the very heart 
of God. Okay, Luke chapter 15, starting in verse one. Luke tells us, now the tax collectors and sinners, two groups of people, right? The tax collectors were so bad that uh, they didn't want to be lumped in. The sinners didn't want to be lumped in with the tax collectors. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and he eats with them. This man, this man, it means like this one, that person. It had derogatory intent. Like he's not even worthy of a title. And he welcomes sinners. He welcomes them. He receives them and he gives access relationally to them. And he eats with them. A meal was a a mechanism of fellowship and deep connection. And they were disgusted by this. The, The Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they were disgusted. They were repulsed by the fact that Jesus gave relational access to sinners and tax collectors. It made them so angry. Because what they saw is they saw themselves morally and religiously superior because of how they obeyed the law. They saw themselves as morally and religiously superior because they obeyed the law better than everybody else. And ironically, their obedience to the law and what they would say their love for God is what actually drove this self-righteous and toxic attitude. And I don't know about you, but it's certainly true for me. It is so easy for me to read this. And come on, it's so easy for us to read this and think, oh, those Pharisees, how could they? How could they? I mean, they're so mean. Like, I, 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 if, if they're so unfair to Jesus. But come on, just for a second, be honest. And don't tell anybody, just be honest with yourself. Isn't it so true that we are so prone to do the same thing? Come on, let me just, I know we're just gonna know each other, but let me just, let's just be honest for a second. If you have ever, if you have ever had an inkling of moral superiority or felt better than somebody else because you obey the Bible and they don't, same thing. If you've ever looked down on somebody and had to do with your religious belief and their lack of religious belief, same thing. If you've ever put somebody in a category that was less than yours, same thing. Come on, if we're just being honest, In the name of religion, we are all susceptible to missing the very heart of God. This was a couple years ago. I'm a a golfer. Well, I try to play golf. So if that's the definition of a golfer, I am a golfer. Because of my four kids, I rarely get the chance to. But a couple years ago, me and some friends of mine took a trip to a famous golf course here in the United States. It's called Sweeten's Cove. It is this beautiful nine hole hole golf course right in the middle of these, um, in a valley. So you've got mountain ranges on the side and it is just beautiful. But what makes this um, golf course so famous is that they are notorious for having no rules. They run their golf course differently than any other golf course in the country. In fact, if you ever played golf or been to a country club, right, you've got to have your shirt tucked in and there's so many rules and etiquette and you've got to do it right. This golf course has none of that. In fact, it's kind of crazy. If you like golf, it might stress you out. They don't care what hole you start on. You could walk, you could ride a cart. In fact, some holes have different holes you could shoot to on the green. I mean, they don't care what you do. In fact, they got so much flack. They got so, they, they, you, could, you could start with 15 people on one hole in one group. I mean, when I say no rules, it's no rules. And they got so much flack for not having any rules, they finally decided to have a rule. Keep your shirt on, okay? That's the extent of their rules. In fact, every year, sign-ups to play, registration to sign up to play at this golf course sells out in 15 minutes. It is unbelievable. But here's what I love about this place. They pride themselves in being an anti-golf golf course an anti-golf golf course. And how they explained that was this. They did not want all the periphery things about golf to rob people from the beauty of enjoying the game of golf. Jesus was the most anti-religious, religious figure the first century had ever seen. Jesus was a rabbi, he was religious, but he was so anti-religion that created categories and got in the way of relationship. He was so anti-religion that clouded the beauty of what he came to offer, relationship with your heavenly 
Father. And Jesus wanted to shatter our categories. He wants to shatter our categories. And he was uninterested and remains to be uninterested in a religious system that breeds self-righteousness, that creates categories of good and bad. And he was uninterested and remains to be uninterested in a religious system where people have to earn their favor, earn their way into favor with God based on behavior. So in response to the muttering of these religious leaders and the Pharisees. And again, the beautiful picture, you've got tax collectors and sinners sitting all around him, taking it all in. He tells these three famous parables. Jesus, he goes on, tells them these parables. And the first one, you've all, you've all, you've all heard this, the, the parable of the lost sheep. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? Now, I'm not a shepherd. Um, my answer to this question would be, nah, I've got 99. I'm not sweating the one. I've got plenty. I'm good. But he asked this question in an agricultural society and the question is rhetorical. Of course, you would absolutely leave the 99 to go find the one that you lost. So he's got everybody nodding along. And then he goes on. And when, when he finds it, when he finds a lost sheep, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders. You can hear the high purple. He's trying to play this up. Puts it on his shoulders and he goes home. Then he calls his friends and his neighbors together. And he says, rejoice with me. Celebrate with me. I have found my lost sheep. So they're probably, you know, smirking, chuckling along a little bit with the hyperbole. And then Jesus leans in and makes them a little bit uncomfortable. And he says, I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Who you suddenly, you've got the religious leaders. Well, hang on, what do they do? Why, why are they lost? Did they make the appropriate sacrifice to Jesus? What have said, uh, it's besides the point. That's your religion. I've come to offer something different. And here's the principle, you know this. When we lose something of value, our focus is on what is lost rather than what's unlost. You know this, not because what is unlost is unimportant, but because it isn't lost, right? You know this, there is no emotional compensation for what you haven't lost when there is something that you have lost, okay? Imagine me, I've got four girls. Imagine I wanna give my wife a night off and I take them out to eat and we go have some fun. And then imagine I lose one of my kids, what do you think would happen if I went home without one of my kids? And Julie's like, hey, where's everybody? I'm like, hey, bad news. I lost Harper, but no worries, because I still got three. I mean, that, it sounds ridiculous, right? There's no way that would fly. But we do the same thing, that whenever there is something valuable that is lost, you do not focus on. In fact, you neglect what is unlost in order to find what was lost. So then Jesus, he leans in a little bit more and he says, or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? Now, Jesus here uses a woman so intentionally because here's what we all know. A guy would have no chance of finding that coin. Am I right? No chance, no chance. But the woman, she's relentless. She is relentless. The emphasis is on the effort and the concern for that lost coin. And when she finds it, Jesus says, when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and she says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. So now he's included the men and the women and then he makes them a little more uncomfortable. And he says, so in the same way, he repeats it. In the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Well, the religious leaders, well, why are they, why are they lost? Did they, did they, are they now clean? Are they ceremonially clean? Did they go through all the steps in the law? And Jesus is like, well, that's, that's not the point. They're found. You know this. When we lose something of value, we are relentless in our pursuit of it. We are relentless in our pursuit of it. <clears throat> you, have you ever lost an AirPod? You know what I'm talking about? You lost an AirPod or you lost your keys and it drives you crazy. Um, I'm notorious for losing my wallet and I just bought an AirTag. Okay, that's the, the Apple product that you can put on something that tracks stuff. I bought an AirTag to put in my wallet. Ironically, it took me a week to find my wallet to put the AirTag in it, okay? When you lose something of value, you are relentless in your pursuit 
of it. So Jesus, man, he's built up this tension. He's got everybody leaning in. He's got the religious leaders a little bit uncomfortable. What, what do you mean sinners? They've repented and they're here and they're this and they're okay. Where are you going with this? And then he, he hits them with one more. And he says, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger one said to his father, the younger one said to his father, give me my share of the estate. Now this would have been so offensive. In other words, here's what he's saying. Hey, um, dad, you know that inheritance that I'm gonna get when you die? Uh, I would just like to have it now. In other words, hey dad, you're pretty much as good as dead to me. So why don't you just give me what I'm supposed to get when you die? Let's just speed this process up a little bit. I mean, this would have been so offensive, honestly, in any culture, but especially in a Middle Eastern culture. Something unbelievable happens. The dad, Jesus said, this is a parable, so it didn't really happen, but he's using it to prove his point. He divided his property between his two sons and he gave the younger son what would be rightfully his. And you know the story from there, right? The young son goes out and off in wild living, he buys and does whatever his heart desires. He eventually runs out of money. A famine hits. He's got no food, a place to stay. He ends up finding himself working on a pig farm, an unclean animal in the Jewish context. So Jesus is really pouring it on. In fact, Jesus in the parable, he tells us that the son is so hungry that he longs to eat what the pigs are eating. Jesus is setting up this picture that the son is irretrievably lost. I mean, he is so disgraced in the eyes of the religious leaders and the Pharisees. In this parable, this son, I mean, they're probably wincing in disgust hearing about him working at a pig farm. He is past the point of no return. Then Jesus turns the parable. Eventually the son, he comes to his senses And he says, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. Don't miss this. The son comes to his senses, but do you know what begins to turn him? The goodness of his father. He remembers the goodness of the heart of his dad. And so what does he do? decides he's going to practice the speech. I will set out and I'm going to go back to my father. I'm going to say to him, we've all been there. You've gotten in trouble and you've, you, you've practiced the speech that you were going to say, father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and he went to his father. So he made the trek. And again, you can only imagine You can only imagine Um, he's practicing this speech the whole way home, getting it just right, nervous about how his father is going to respond to him. Everybody in the audience is leaning in as Jesus is sharing this parable. But while, Jesus tells us, he was still a long way off, he's all the way down the road. His father saw him as if he'd been keeping his eyes on the road the whole time he'd been gone, waiting for his return. His father saw him and he was filled with blank for him. What would you put here? Honestly, what would you put here? Or, or, or what, what is like your default to put here? What have you put here in the past? Maybe there's somebody right now, like there's a group of people that you put one thing in that blank for, but another group of people that are, there's, they're too far gone you'd put something different in the blank. Come on, just real quick. What you put in that blank just says something about your heart. And what I put in that blank, because I'm just susceptible to get this wrong as you, what I put in that blank says something about me. And what we as a church put in that blank says something about whether or not we are aligned fully with the heart of our heavenly Father. And so to the shock of everyone listening, I can only imagine this moment. To the shock of everybody listening to Jesus' parable. His father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and he kissed him. And then the son, this is beautiful, the son said to him, he starts saying the speech. I mean, he, he, he practices speech too much at this point. He's got to get it out. Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father, the father said to his servants, quick, quick, 
Bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. This is how I read this moment. You know when you're so excited to tell somebody something that you don't hear anything that comes out of their mouth because you're just so ready to say what you want to say? This is how I read that moment. The, the dad sees a son. He's filled with compassion. He runs down, he hugs him, and he kisses him, by the way, which would have been an absolute shock in that culture. Like men would not do that. A Jewish man running. I mean, this was so crazy and shocking. And as the son starts practicing speech, I don't even think the dad heard it. I don't think the dad heard a single thing that the son said. In fact, I think he immediately interrupts him and he says, no, 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 none of that. He gives him the ring. He gives him the robe and he kills a fat calf, which is something that most people would have done one time in their life. Why? The Pharisees and the teachers of the law are thinking, are you compassion? He deserved this. He didn't deserve this. He deserved what he got. He's the one that disrespected you. You don't disrespect your father. He's the one that went and squandered his wealth on sinful living and pleasures and sex and drugs and God knows what else. And now he's unclean because of the pigs. And don't miss the irony, the fact that the, the dad hugged him even though he'd been unclean. I mean, come on, there's, there's so much shock in this. Why would the dad do this? And then Jesus, again, you can only imagine what they were thinking. He said, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. <clears throat> he was lost. He was relationally disconnected from me, but now he is found. So they began to celebrate. The reason Jesus came was so that we could be connected to our heavenly father. And the reason why we should care about those that are disconnected from God is because Jesus cared about those that were disconnected from God. And Jesus shocks them with the response of the father who reflects the very heart of our heavenly father. This parable is famously known as the parable of the prodigal son. Now, I don't know if you knew this, but prodigal is an interesting word. We don't use it very often. The definition of prodigal is this, recklessly extravagant, having spent everything. Yeah, prodigal son. He was reckless. He spent all his money. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. But Tim Keller, Tim Keller has since passed, a writer, brilliant pastor and writer, his take on this was so inspiring. He actually makes the argument that this son shouldn't be called, or this parable shouldn't be called the parable of the prodigal son, that there's a better name for the parable. The parable, prodigal, God. That if anybody is prodigal in this scenario, it is the father, it is God. The father's response is beyond the wildest imagination of the son and to the shock of everyone listening. This is a picture of God's heart for those relationally disconnected from him. And in the story, the father is recklessly extravagant with his grace. You can hear the Pharisees now. Well, what if he just does it again? What if he does it again next time? Has he actually learned his lesson? Is he back for the right reasons? In fact, the way that the parable immediately shifts to the older brother, it's as if Jesus is saying, none of that mattered because what mattered is he is back. He is relationally connected again. The prodigal God who spent everything when he sent his son to die on the cross to save you and to save me. A prodigal God that held nothing back to make relationship possible. And there was never a guarantee, come on, that we would never mess it up again. His response is always mercy and grace. Those the religious looked down upon, Jesus looked for. And if your version of Christianity is a religion that creates categories, Jesus would say, lose that religion and instead come follow me and join me on my mission. Come on, for all of us, which requires an awareness that we too were once lost, but now we're fine, we're found. But we didn't earn it and we certainly didn't behave our way into it. 
Jesus with this parable, this point. He's speaking to the religious leaders. Ironically, this was a parable to them. The tax collectors and sinners, they're listening, but this was to the muttering of the Pharisees and religious leaders. He's saying this to them, and he's saying this to you and me. I came to seek the lost. So should you. I came on a mission to seek the lost. I came on a mission to build relationship with. I came on a mission to extend kindness and grace. I came on mission to build relationship, br- relational bridges with those that are disconnected from God. So should you. So can I just ask you a question? As a follower of Jesus, as the church, come on. Who needs you to see them? Who needs you to see them the way Jesus saw tax collectors and sinners, because everyone for whom you come eyeball to eyeball with is somebody for whom Jesus died. So who needs you to see them? Come on, who needs you to love them? Who needs you to come alongside them? Who needs you to invest in them? Who needs you to put aside your own self-righteousness and see them as a human being that is no worse off than us just because we know Jesus? Come on, who needs you to see them the way Jesus saw tax collectors and sinners? When we see them the way that Jesus did and align our hearts with the heart of our heavenly father, this is how we can turn and change the reputation of the local church. And this is how we live on mission with the very heart of God. Who, who needs an invitation from you that's as simple as come sit with me? Come on. Who needs to hear from you? Hey, why don't, you, why don't you come sit with me at church? Hey, I know you're going through a lot. Why don't you come sit with me? Hey, I know you've got a lot of questions about faith. My church is a little bit different. Why don't you come sit with me? Hey, I know you've had a bad church experience, but my, my, my church is just a little bit different. I, I don't want to speak. I'm not speaking badly about other churches. Why don't, you just, why don't you come sit with me? Who is someone that you completely disagree with? Who is someone that maybe you've even been at odds with? But you need to put that down and put aside your religion and pick up the way of Jesus and say, why don't you come sit with me? And let's fill the church up with those on the outside of faith so that they can experience the life-changing love and grace of God. Jesus. Let's not be a group of churches that are just so insider focused and I got to get there to get to my seat and get my coffee, get my parking spot. And I just worry about myself, get my kids. But we actually start thinking about how can Sunday be more than just about me? So who can I extend the invitation to come sit with me? Come on. I want all of us, the church, and I mean in the United States, in South Africa, the global church of Jesus, to get this right. We can change the tide. We can change the reputation. And I want to be a church. Come on, I want your churches to be churches of people that are following in the way of Jesus and are outward facing. So aligned with the heart of God. That even people that are nothing like us, like us, just like people that were nothing like Jesus, liked Jesus. And may they encounter the life-changing love and grace of their heavenly Father. So, decision's yours, the decision's mine. But let's be churches that keep our eyes on the road. It's an honor to be with you today and it'd be my honor to pray for you. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for your heart towards those relationally disconnected from you. And today we're so grateful for it because that was once us. And Jesus came for us. So I pray today, Lord, you would break our hearts for those relationally disconnected from you. You would break our hearts to those that are far from you and may our churches begin to be a part of the solution. May our churches carry forth your kingdom mission to see the lost found. Put people on our path that need Jesus. Give us the courage to extend the invitation, come sit with me. And may we begin 
And may we begin again. And may we change the reputation of churches. May we be the type of churches that keep our eyes on the road. In Jesus' name, amen.